So, welcome to another episode of The Nerdy Company Guy. You're welcome to figure out for yourself which one of us is which. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about Star Trek. Real Star Trek. And then the J.J. Abrams Star Trek. Uh, obviously, I even my introduction is going to be a sore point for some people, which is exactly why we created this show. The fact that we're aiming for a 15-minute uh, uh, format is not going to do justice to the issue. But let's start. And I think we should start with... Um, Rick here, whose name I almost nearly forgot to answer for a moment, uh, because you've only seen the J.J. Abrams Star Trek. Star Trek. I've only so have, seen the J.J. No Abrams. background in Star Trek. Let's give our background on Star Trek so people will understand where we're coming from. Rick, obviously, you've only seen the J.J. Abrams ones, right? Yeah. And Kermit, how much have you seen? I have seen almost all Star Trek. I gave up on Voyager somewhere around fifth season, or no, I gave up somewhere around the fifth season. Yeah, somewhere around fifth season. I think yeah, I came yeah. back for the last season. You did. I just... Uh, you missed all the good episodes. <laughs> just I'm a huge Voyager fan. I'm a DS9 fan. I'm a Next Gen fan. I'm not so much an original series fan, which pisses him off, but... Uh, That's I, okay. You will be once you actually get into it. Uh, I also am a fan of the J.J. Abrams series. Right. I do exclude Enterprise, um, and the reason I exclude Enterprise is I feel as if they never really committed to the show. If you look at the other Star Trek series, how many seasons did they go? In the future, we will discuss iterations of, of Star Trek, and we can go over right. the differences between them, because he's be totally here. wrong again. But I can understand where he's coming from, and Enterprise bears some discussion. But, for the time being, we're sticking with Star Trek versus J.J. Abrams' Star Trek. Why don't you like the J.J. Abrams? Unfortunately, that goes on for more than 15 minutes. So I'll sum it up for right. you. It's pretty much just a new flashy version that, has, that doesn't have the heart. What is the heart Star of Star Trek? Now this is where we get to the crux of the argument. Yeah. So, right. so J.J. Abrams' Star Trek was basically founded on a couple of inherent principles. And I, I think they speak to a larger issue with failures in doing franchise movies and whatnot. But basically it boils down to this. J.J. Abrams doesn't like Star Trek and didn't watch Star Trek. He didn't grow up watching Star Trek. He doesn't... He said that? Yeah. We actually, uh, we had him in the building once for an interview for G4. Uh, and I don't know if we aired that part of the interview or not, but he tell, he did not grow up with Star Trek because he didn't watch it because he didn't like it. He, he didn't like watching it. And some people did. And that's fine. If you don't like Star Trek, that's all good. Star Trek isn't for everyone, and it, it, it has particular you know, conceits in its storytelling and whatnot. Which would be fine, except you don't take somebody who doesn't like Star Trek to make a Star Trek movie, except that was the reason they picked J.J. Abrams. They wanted a Star Trek that would appeal to a new audience, and the general concept behind that was Star Trek for people who don't like Star Trek. Uh, no, I think you're simplifying. I don't think it was for people who don't like Star Trek. I think it's for people who like movies, but have not gotten into the Star Trek demographic. But the problem is, is that Star Trek... There is a kind of storytelling unique to Star Trek and pretty much unique to other franchises. And when you deviate from that storytelling, things go wrong. We ran into the same problem with Star Wars. George Lucas changed the way he was telling his Star Wars story. Let's stay away from Star Wars. Right. But no, he did. Uh, I'm not arguing, let's stay away from right. Star Wars. And that's, that's the same thing. There, is, there are elements of storytelling styles and focuses that make franchises unique. Uh, Transformers had things that made it unique. Uh, Star Wars had things that made it unique. Star Trek has things that make it unique. Things that set it apart from Babylon 5, from Star Wars. What, what are the, your top three things that set Star Trek apart? Star Trek is written very much like classic science fiction. It is about human beings. Virtually every... The vast majority of Star Trek episodes, and all the really good ones, are essentially stories about human beings discovering what it means to be human, being confronted with an issue that asks them to make a question or a decision, uh, being confronted with a situation that causes them to uh, uh, question how things work. It's all about what it is to be human. And in fact, the, the utterly brilliant series finale of Next Gen explicitly states that. It's about discovering the limitless reaches of your own human consciousness. That's what Star Trek is about. It's not about phasers and photons. It's not about black holes and nebulas. It's not about starships exploding. It's about human beings. Okay, so Star Trek 1 is all about Captain Kirk realizing who he is as a leader. Is it really? Yeah, that's the whole point of the movie. His crisis character moment gets completely flipped out of the movie 
he has one decent moment uh, uh, when Pike is offering him a command. Like, your father, what was it? Your father was captain of the starship for 15 minutes and saved 300 lives. I dare you to do better. That was in the trailers. And I was like sitting here, and when I didn't know anything about how that Star Trek movie was going to go out, like, if that's where they start from, I could be excited about that. And the whole rest of the damn movie was lasers, explosions, the single most forgettable villain in science fiction movie history. Yeah, I don't even remember who the villain was. Yeah, no, is. like, I, I told somebody at one point, uh, uh, Eric Bana was in Star Trek, uh, J.J. Abrams' Star Trek, to a guy I was talking about Star Trek in, the, in a room. He goes, he really was? Who was he? Like, he was the big Romulan villain. Romulan villain? There's a, and like, literally, the guy had forgotten that yeah. the character existed. Because... It's all about Captain Kirk becoming a hero. That's all I remember. Yeah, it is about Captain Kirk becoming a hero because what is it? He jumps out of a ship in a little, little, little glider sequence and he beats up some aliens and he shoots some explosions. But he was like a rogue renegade, and then he like gets he realizes his potential. Like, isn't that a human element? Like, we all have potential. Do we but find it? Question. Now, now, hold on. All right. Let's no, segue let's... back to the original series. Give some ideas of why right. original series takes priority over the new series. Actually, actually, there's a moment in J.J. Abrams' Star Trek which illustrates the difference between knowing Captain Kirk and growing up with the Captain Kirk of Gene Roddenberry era with J.J. Abrams not getting Captain Kirk. And it all comes down to the Kobayashi Maru. Uh, for anybody who hasn't heard the, start, the term, the Kobayashi Maru is a test in Star Trek. It's a command test. It's called the unbeatable scenario, and basically what they do is they throw a bunch of uh, cadets into a uh, into a ship scenario. They give them a mission, and the mission is unwinnable. The, the 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 computer program will make it so that the cadet cannot win the mission. You will fail, no matter you what. You will fail, no matter and they, what. And they want to see what you do when you do fail. Yeah. Well, they want to see what you do when you can't win. It's not when you fail; it's when you can't win. What kind of person are you? when you're confronted with an unwinnable objective. Which is going deep into the humanity of right. the character. which is beautiful. It's like, it's, uh, 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 William Shatner gets a chance to talk, like, it's not, uh, uh, there is no correct resolution, it's a test of character. Uh -huh. And you can't measure character, you can't get an A or a B or a C, it's really just a snapshot of who you are. Okay. I, I thought that was... did it wrong. Well, no, J.J. Abrams did it wrong, and here's why. Yeah. So... You only do it once in Star Trek. It shows up in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And at that point, Kirk has already taken the test, and he's confronting another cadet that's taken the test. And you have William Shatner having to show, over the entire course of the movie, why what he did during the Kobayashi Maru, he cheated. He broke the, uh, he, he basically hacked the program and made it possible to win the game. And This is in the show, in the old movie. This is in the Star Trek II, Wrath Star of Khan. Star Trek proper. Okay. Yeah, Star Trek, the... the the real Wrath of Khan. Uh, anyway, but in that movie, uh, he spends his time with this cadet, and over the course of the movie, you find out why that makes sense for him. Why him cheating is actually the conclusion of the test. Uh, and I have kind of, I kind of got, to, got to go into an explanation for this. You kind of got to understand who Kirk is in order to understand why J.J. Abrams failed at this particular scene. J.J. Abrams gets a chance to do the very same thing. He actually gets a chance to see Kirk in the Academy. Of course, we skip his entire Academy career, and we only, we only start at the beginning and then the end. But we actually get the bit where Kirk uh, 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 plays the test, fails it, realizes he can't beat it, goes back, cheats, and wins the test. And J.J. Abrams gets a chance to show this scene, and I was so looking forward to this. This was really the moment where J.J. Abrams could prove to me that he gets Star Trek. He can do whatever he wants with the character, the setting, the time, sequencing, but if he gets the character right, he's okay in my book. So the the group, uh, uh, the, the the tribunal, whatever it is, uh, uh, the, 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 the review board, hauls Kirk in front of the, uh, uh, the board and says, you basically violated uh, school policy by cheating on the test. And Kirk delivers his line. It's a line that they stole right out of Star Trek II, which is, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. That's fine. I, as, if I remember correctly watching the movie, I, uh, he even gets asked the questions like, you know, what do you mean you don't believe in the no-win scenario? Or, or, you know, somebody actually asks him why he thinks he's justified in cheating. Mm -hmm. And you know what happens? Whoop, 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 alert, Vulcan's under attack. All the cadets get up and they run off and they go to the Enterprise and action begins. He never answers the question. What's the answer? The answer's complicated and that's why it would take time. 
Does he answer it in The Wrath of Khan? He only answers it in what he does, and that's kind of the point. You gotta like, know Kirk, and you gotta watch what <coughs> Kirk does. But in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, how to describe this? Kirk...